Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll's 1865 novel is one of the most famous works of literature for young people that's charmed readers of all ages for more than 150 years. Part of the novel's enduring appeal is its resonant motifs and innovative literary devices. Wonderland is a dream, and the characters and settings change in dreamlike ways. Because Lewis Carroll was a mathematics professor at the University of Oxford, it isn't surprising that he engages in number play and parodies the teaching of mathematics in Alice in Wonderland. Such references to mathematics are superficial in comparison to his subtle jabs at the symbolic algebra that intrigued so many of his contemporaries. Science was a popular topic in Victorian times too, and there are many references to topics in the natural sciences, such as evolution, metamorphosis, and the characteristics of specific animal characters in the novel. Nothing in Wonderland is quite as expected. In fact, it's often just the opposite. Inversion and reversal showcase this. Not only do characters do things backwards and misinterpret one another at every turn, but another example of inversion and reversal is Carol's pervasive literary use of parody. Many of the verses in the book are more than nonsensical or silly rewordings of well-known poems. They undermine the original morals or messages of those poems. The novel is notably packed with puns, trick questions, and other entertaining forms of wordplay readers will see at every turn. On a May afternoon, seven-year-old protagonist Alice is dozing on a sunny riverbank. Suddenly a big white rabbit, another key character, carrying a pocket watch, rushes by. Alice impetuously follows him down a rabbit hole that turns into a long tunnel. Unsurprisingly, the journey is one of the most important symbols in the book. Despite its dreamlike qualities, Alice in Wonderland shares the same focus as many other fantasy and adventure novels, that of the main character's journey. This journey is not only geographical, but also psychological and emotional. In tandem with her journey through Wonderland, Alice progresses toward adulthood, learning to question the orders she receives and to rely on herself. When she finally lands after going down the rabbit hole, she's in a dark hallway, and the white rabbit is nowhere to be seen. Alice's first challenge in Wonderland is figuring out what size to be. She eats and drinks several mysterious substances that change her size from tiny to huge and back again. At nine feet tall, she cries a pool of tears. At three inches tall, she's forced to swim through the pool with a crowd of talking animals. The white rabbit soon orders her to go to his house and fetch his gloves and fan. This speaks to the pervasive symbol of following orders. Wonderland demands that Alice perform actions before she discovers the consequences. For instance, Alice is repeatedly told to consume something without being told what it is. Although Alice sometimes wonders whether she should keep sampling unidentified food and drink, she generally complies. Some scholars have suggested that this is because Alice typifies the obedient Victorian female obeying the rules of a patriarchal society. But Alice's own curiosity also plays a part, as she simply wants to see what will happen when she drinks and eats all the things she's given. Alice complies with many other orders in the course of the story, such as going to get the white rabbit's gloves and fan here, even though she's not the servant girl he's mistaken her for. This may also be seen as her being obedient or curious, but it should be noted that the major shifts in the story occur when she ceases to follow orders and acts on her own initiative. Alice grows so big that she fills the white rabbit's house. She shrinks so fast that her chin hits her foot. Finally, she meets a caterpillar sitting on a mushroom who tells her that she can control her size depending on which side of the mushroom she eats. Once again, the symbol of growing and shrinking shows up. Alice undergoes 12 size changes in Wonderland. Repeatedly, she's the wrong size for whatever she's trying to do. Too big to get into the garden, too small to reach the key that would help her get in, and so on. Until the caterpillar gives Alice the mushroom, she can't control how big or small she gets. She just has to accept whatever happens. Of course, children can't control their growing in real life, and children at the stage of puberty are famously awkward. They feel too small for some things and too big for others. The growing and shrinking in the book is clearly a sign for growing up, for reaching maturity. As Carol depicts it, growing up is a painful and confusing process, and it doesn't necessarily have positive results. Alice begins to explore Wonderland, hoping to reach a garden she spied through a door in the tunnel. On her way, she meets an increasingly strange cast of central characters, beginning with the Duchess, who hands over a screaming baby. A few minutes later, the baby turns into a pig and walks away. Next comes the Cheshire Cat, who can appear and vanish at will and tells Alice, we're all mad here. Alice meets the main character, the Hatter, 
the March Hare, and the Dormouse. The Hatter bafflingly explains that the previous March, he murdered the time, sang off the beat, and the time punished him by stopping the clock at six o'clock in the evening, so that it's always tea time. When Alice joins their tea party, they treat her so rudely that she leaves. Alice finds a way into the garden, but it turns out to be more bizarre than beautiful, with gardeners painting a white rose bush red. The garden belongs to the king, and more importantly, the key character, the Queen of Hearts. Animated playing cards who have just arrived for a croquet game along with the rest of the deck of cards. The hidden garden is one of the main symbols of the book. Readers will recall that Alice spent a lot of time trying to get into the garden that she sees for the first time in Chapter 2. Walled vegetable gardens are more common than the walled flower garden Alice enters, but walled flower gardens are generally more attractive to the imagination. In Alice in Wonderland, the garden symbolism is fluid. Obviously, it shares imagery with the Garden of Eden, a lost paradise. It can also be seen to represent unattainable beauty. It looks beautiful when Alice sees it from afar, but the loveliness vanishes as soon as she's actually inside the garden in Chapter 8. Gardeners are painting the roses, a croquet game is being set up, and the angry Queen of Hearts is storming around spreading panic wherever she goes. The garden is like a dream within a dream. The setting changes without warning, and none of the action is logical. Alice joins the croquet game, which is difficult to play because flamingos are used as mallets and hedgehogs as croquet balls. Even more disruptive is the Queen of Hearts, who keeps demanding that one or another character be beheaded. Finally, the only players left are the King and Queen of Hearts, Alice and the Duchess. The Queen orders the Griffin to introduce Alice to the Mock Turtle, a morose creature who recounts a long story about his school days. The Griffin and the Mock Turtle teach Alice an intricate dance called the Lobster Quadrille. Alice, in turn, tries to recite some poems, but as always happens in Wonderland, she keeps getting the words wrong. She's describing her adventures to the Griffin and Mock Turtle when a voice calls from the distance. The trial is starting! Alice goes back to the croquet ground, where a trial has been set up. The Knave of Hearts is charged with stealing the Queen's tarts. Alice watches as the jurors try to write down their own names to keep from forgetting them. The King of Hearts, as presiding judge, tells the witnesses not to be nervous, or I'll have you executed on the spot. Just before she's called as a witness, Alice realizes she's growing again. She accidentally knocks over the jury box, and all the jurors topple out. Alice begins her questioning, and none of the proceedings make any sense. And Alice points this out. After all, she's now so tall, she's not afraid of anyone in the court. When the queen orders that the knave be sentenced before a verdict is given, Alice says loudly, stuff and nonsense. The queen calls for her execution, and Alice exclaims, you're nothing but a pack of cards. The entire pack rises into the air and flies down on her. Screaming, Alice tries to beat them off her. And she wakes to find that she's lying on the big river bank and that her big sister is brushing some leaves off her face. She tells her sister about her odd dream. Her sister sends Alice in to have her tea, but the older girl lingers on the bank, dreaming about Alice's adventures. Alice in Wonderland is a children's book, and a nonsensical one at that, based on a story that Lewis Carroll told to three young sisters. But the book provides themes all ages can relate to. Communication breakdown is one. From the beginning of her stay in Wonderland, Alice finds she has trouble communicating with the creatures she meets. In general, many characters preach at Alice rather than share ideas. All these exchanges recall and parody real-world social situations in which strangers and acquaintances meet and attempt to make conversation. Charles Dodgson, the real name of author Lewis Carroll, was a reserved man who suffered from a stammer since childhood. He was all too familiar with the pitfalls inherent in the types of social situations Alice encounters in Wonderland, and his parodies focus on the problem of breakdowns in social communication. Growing up, and down, is a theme symbolized by Alice's 12 changes in size while she's in Wonderland. When she's tiny, she can't reach what she needs. But when she's giant, she frightens everyone away. She's a child, but she has no control over what happens to her body. In the end, Alice can't escape growing up. She even matures in the course of her adventures, learning to trust her instincts more and to make informed judgments on the actions of the characters she meets, actions often frowned upon in Victorian England. Children tend to form their identity based around those around them. Their parents, their siblings, their circle of friends, and how those people view and respond to them. When Alice finds herself alone in Wonderland, she starts to question her identity, another main theme. Not only does she see the world from a new perspective, but the creatures she meets do not respond to her as she's used to. 
Wonderland is full of rules that have little to do with how people should behave toward one another. Rules versus good behavior is a theme depicted by a strange child landing in front of Wonderland's denizens and the way she's aggressively dealt with in a frustrated way. At first, Alice is startled by the rudeness, but tries to remain polite. But as she progresses through Wonderland, she becomes more assertive and less concerned with appearing polite. Self-reliance is another main theme. Alice chooses her own path when she follows the White Rabbit into Wonderland. And despite feeling utterly disoriented, she manages to hold it together. Like any seven-year-old, she breaks down from time to time, but she never despairs, and she accepts the fact that she alone is responsible for being in Wonderland. She's definitely not a helpless little Victorian girl. Finally, Alice in Wonderland is full of comments on Victorian society, in which Carol found much to criticize. He addresses topics such as how children are raised and disciplined, the middle-class obsession with time and punctuality, and 19th century views on mental illness. Carol returns again and again to the one area of Victorian life with which he himself was most involved, education. Carol frequently subverts the content and parodies the tasks associated with schooling. The original Alice was a real girl, Alice Liddell, whose family lived near Charles Dodgson, Lewis Carroll, in Oxford, England. On a July day in 1862, Dodgson told Alice and her sisters a story he made up on the spot about a little girl who had amazing adventures when she jumped down a rabbit hole. Alice Liddell asked Dodgson to write down the story, and in 1864, he presented her with a handwritten, hand-illustrated manuscript he called Alice's Adventures Underground. A century and a half later, that book and its sequel have been translated into 174 languages and remain beloved by readers of all ages and stages in life.